This is the Mass of the third Sunday after Pentecost. It is the Sunday within the octave of the most sacred art of Jesus. The epistle is taken from St. Peter, chapter 5. Dearly beloved, be you humbled under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in the time of visitation, casting all your care upon him, for he has care of you. <coughs> be sober and watch, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist ye strong in the faith, knowing that the same affliction befalls your brethren who are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto the eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little, will himself perfect you, and confirm you, and establish you. To him be glory and empire, forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel. <clears throat> From St. Luke, chapter 15. At that time the publicans and sinners drew near unto Jesus to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. And he spoke to them this parable, What man is there of you that has a hundred sheep? And if he, if he shall lose one of them, does he not leave the ninety-nine in the desert, and go after that which was lost until he finds it? And when he hath found it, lays it upon his shoulders, rejoicing and coming home, calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep that was lost. I say to you that, even so, there shall be joy in heaven upon one sinner that doth penance, more than upon ninety-nine just who need no penance. Or what woman, having ten groats, if she lose one groat, does not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found that groat which I had lost. So I say to you, there shall be joy before the angels of God upon one sinner doing penance. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Uh, right after Mass, I'll be bringing Holy Communion to Zeta Owens, so pray for her. And then I have a flight to catch to Atlanta. <clears throat> we are in the beautiful, traditionally, the eight days of the octave of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In these days, we honor the most sacred heart of Jesus. We adore the sacred heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus was open for us on the cross. It was a gesture of humiliating Christ, who was hanging on the cross. He had already been found dead. So instead of breaking his bones, the soldier pierced open his side piercing right into the heart. And outside of his heart poured out blood and water. So two, two prophecies of Moses were fulfilled here. First, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. That was fulfilled. And secondly, they shall not break a bone of his. And that goes to the Paschal Lamb of Moses. They were to eat the lamb but not break any bones. And this prefigured our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, opening his fountain of mercy and love poured out on the cross. And this is what is, happens at the Mass. The Mass reenacts the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and outpours 
the flood of graces and mercy over the whole world. Listen to these beautiful words of St. Bonaventure, speaking of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. <clears throat> Your heart, dearest Jesus, is the great treasure, the precious jewel, which we will find in the dug field of your sacred body. Who is there who would throw away this jewel? Rather would I give up all my own jewels and diamonds, exchange all my thoughts and affections for it, and cast my cares upon your sacred heart, which will nourish me without fail. Having found this heart, therefore, which is both yours and mine, most kind Jesus, I will pray to you as my God. Place this prayer of mine, for unto this purpose your side was pierced, that an entrance would lie open to us. For this purpose your heart was wounded, that detached from worldly tumult and concerns we should be able to dwell in your heart. But above all, your heart was wounded so that a visible scar would enable us to see the invisible wound of your love. For how could the ardor of your love be better, better shown than by this, that not only your body, but even your very heart was pierced with a lance? Truly the wounds of the flesh showed forth the wounds of the spirit. Who will not cherish this heart so wounded for us? Who will not love one so loving, embrace one so pure? As for us who are dwelling still in the flesh, let us use every opportunity to respond to him who has loved us. Let us embrace him who was pierced for us, whose hands and feet, his side and heart were dug by the wicked vine tenders. And let us pray that the Sacred Heart may deign to wound our heart, still so hard, still so impenitent, and bind it with the bonds of his love. So the beautiful heart of Jesus opened on the cross is opening to us all the treasures, all the graces. And our Lord gave to St. Margaret Mary the twelve promises of, to those who honor the Sacred Heart of Jesus. He will help you in all our difficulties. He will bless the homes. He will help priests touch the hardened and most hardened hearts. He will give graces on all the undertakings and all the aspirations of those who trust in the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So let us put all our confidence and trust in Him. And notice when our Lord in the Gospel speaks of the one lost sheep and the lost coin. And when they find it, they call all their friends and neighbors to rejoice. This shows us that when we find the heart of Jesus, when we find the Holy Catholic faith, which is the pearl of great price, which is the path to heaven, which is the joy of the angels, when you discover this, we call our friends and neighbors. That means the social aspect of the reign of Christ the King. That we want all our neighbors to adore the Sacred Heart of Jesus. We want the whole city, we want the whole country to be devoted and consecrated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And this is why when Constantine went to battle, he saw in the sky the Kiro, the symbol of Jesus Christ, and Christ said, in this sign you will conquer. And what is this sign that will conquer? It is given us for these days, it's the Sacred Heart of Jesus. It is the conquering over the Freemasonic lodges and their grip on the political world, the whole political world, and the whole grip of the Judeo-Masons, on the governments, because that's really who runs the U.S. government. And we see that, obviously, now Biden is just a puppet of the higher, darker forces. Our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers of darkness. 
that dwell in the high places, says St. Paul. He understood because he battled the Jews wherever he went. It was always the Jews causing trouble. They stirred up trouble against him constantly. And that sets the tone for the rest of the church's history. There will always be the war against those who love the heart of Jesus, who battle under the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and those who hate and reject the heart of Jesus, and that Jesus Christ is truly the, the true Messiah and the true God. This war will always be to the end of the world. And that's why the Freemasonic Lodges have waged such a war against the Sacred Heart of Jesus. They want him extinguished off the face of the earth. And now they have infiltrated all modern governments, all the politics, all the economics are in their hands, all the banking system, and even now the, the, the modernist conciliar church is in the grip of these enemies of Jesus Christ. But for us, even if there's nobody left, we must fight on, trusting in the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And God has risen up armies and armies of great, great soldiers, great defenders, women and men, to proclaim the reign of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and fight for it. And we see that in all the revolutions. At the French Revolution, it was the great Vendée who had the Sacred Heart of Jesus badged, and they went to war, sometimes only with their hoes and axes, and hammers, that's all they had. But they would rather die fighting than submit to a, a tyrannical government that has thrown Jesus Christ out the window. Also, Andreas Hofer in Austria, he, he was just a farmer and a father of a family, but he they also put the Sacred Heart of Jesus on their chest and they went to war against the armies of Napoleon and defeated him three times. And then they were betrayed. He was betrayed by someone who made deals with the Freemasons and then they were conquered and the Freemasons had revenge on Austria by splitting it in half to try to divide and conquer. And then in the glorious history of Mexico, they also put the Sacred Heart of Jesus in their sombrero, in the top of their hat. And they had a great love and devotion to Christ the King. And how many of them died? Children, men, <clears throat> old men, shouting, Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Nostra Señora de Guadalupe! Long live Christ the King! Long live Our Lady of Guadalupe! And then when you look at the history of Spain, that was the communists tried to destroy and crush Spain. And even to the shame of many, many American boys, there was what was called the Lincoln Blue, the Blue Brigade, which fought with the communists against Catholic Spain. A very terrible thing. And they tried to crush because the Western newspapers and media were saying, the fascist Franco was a, was a fascist, but he was, whatever he was, he was a great leader and he consecrated Spain to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And the American boys with the communists were desecrating the churches, desecrating the Blessed Sacrament, killing the nuns, tearing down the church bells, and they even surrounded the statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and executed Christ the King with a drum roll, ready, aim, fire, and they shot the Sacred Heart of Jesus and then tore the statue down. That's the, this all shows you the real battle that we're in. It's Christ and Satan. And, and then down to our age right now, the traditional Catholics, our strength is in the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. There's our victory over the whole world. So even if we're fighting and we're reduced to just a handful, we're going to win. It doesn't matter. One, you win if you're killed for the faith. You die a martyr and you go straight to heaven. And if we live on, we fight on and we die fighting. Either way, we cannot surrender to 
the Masonic ideas of the, of, the, of the modern world, which are based on the false modern democracy, the false liberalism, modernism, the false principles of liberalism, which are separation of church and state, the liberty of the press, liberty of speech, understood correctly. Liberty of speech is condemned by the church, meaning that you cannot just say heresies and errors. You cannot publish pornography. You cannot publish uh, heresy. That's what it means. Those things should be censored because they cause great harm to souls and innocent souls. Just think of the horrible, horrible, unspeakable parades that are going on this June. Already in Canada and British Columbia, they had children marching, carrying rainbow flags. What a scandal, and what a scandal of the innocence of these children, of which our Lord says, <laughs> Woe to those who scandalize the, these little ones, better that a millstone be tied around their neck and thrown to the bottom of the sea, than to scandalize one of these little ones. But that's all these parades now. This month, they desecrate the month of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And they're, they're not going to win. They're a dying breed. But the Heart of Jesus, he says, I will reign in spite of my enemies. I will reign in spite of my enemies. Listen to Archbishop Lefebvre speaking of the kingship of Jesus Christ. Listen carefully. Do we not say in our daily prayer, the Our Father, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven? But do we want that to happen? We know very well that it is difficult. We know that we must suffer very much. And in spite of that, we must have the lively desire that our Lord Jesus Christ reign over ourselves, over our families, and our society. That is why we want to to conserve the holy sacrifice of the Mass. For do not forget, our Lord reigns by the cross, our Lord vanquished by his cross, and he is king by his cross. And his cross is our Mass. The cross is the Catholic Mass. By destroying, in a certain sense, our holy sacrifice of the Mass, they destroy the affirmation of our Lord Jesus Christ's kingship and of his divinity. And that is why adoration of the Blessed Sacrament has diminished in our time, or rather, let us say, that sacrileges have multiplied endlessly. <laughs> sacrileges of the new mass, <laughs> sacrileges of communion in the hand. Since the Council Vatican II, it must be said, it's plain and clear. Our Lord Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament has been relegated from our altars. He is no longer adored. People no longer want to genuflect before the Blessed Sacrament. And yet, that is the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, acknowledging that He is God, that He is our King, and consequently manifesting this love of our Lord in the existence of His divinity. As proof of this refusal of our Lord's reign, I need only to point to the public event that just took place. In the United States, at the Eucharistic Congress of Philadelphia, this was in 1976, there was no procession of the Blessed Sacrament, but it was a Eucharistic Congress, so they should have a, a, a procession of the Blessed Sacrament. None, because of the Navas Ordo. No, there was not a, a procession, no more than there was four years ago at the Eucharistic Congress in Melbourne in Australia. You know what Cardinal P, Bishop of Poitiers in France, said to the chamber deputies. One day someone told him, but today it is no longer possible for Jesus Christ to reign over society. And this is what Rome says today. This is what Rome has been saying since Vatican II. Christ must not reign. Jesus Christ is not the time for him to reign. And many liberal, liberal Catholics of the modern world say, this is an age of democracy, we can't have the reign of Christ the King. And that's, 
That's actually a heresy to profess that. Because as Catholics, we, must, we are bound to, prof to profess the dogma of the faith of the kingship of Jesus Christ. So we must say, Viva Cristo Rey. We must say, Long live Christ the King. We must say, The Sacred Heart of Jesus, come and reign over our White House, over our country, over our nation. So Archbishop Lefebvre goes on to say, Cardinal P replied to this person and said, If today is no longer the time for our Lord Jesus Christ to reign over societies, then it is no longer the time for societies to endure. In other words, they're going to collapse, be destroyed, and conquered. He was perfectly right. We could give the same answer to the bishop who says the same thing of today, that Christ must not reign. No, now it is no longer Masonic or radical deputies, but Catholic bishops who say, it is no longer the time for our Lord Jesus Christ to reign over the state. Well, we shall always say, our Lord Jesus Christ must reign over the state. Even if it is humanly impossible, even if those who rule no longer want it, we shall continue to affirm that Jesus must reign. We shall chant it, for our Lord Jesus Christ must be King. This is the Catholic spirit right here. This is it. And, you know, look what a joke the modern governments are today. Run by blind leaders leaders of the blind, and passing horrible laws that insult Almighty God, break His commandments, abortion, and, this, and the rainbow movement, and euthanasia, and mass genocide by the wonder drug of Bill Gates, and all these wicked, wicked programs going on in Canada, passing the assisted suicide under the name of Maid. Maid is a beautiful image. A maid is a girl that helps in the house. And now they even desecrate and denigrate that image by assisted suicide. Horrible thing. Archbishop Lefebvre continues, His reign must be established on earth as it is in heaven. It is he himself who said so in the prayer, Christ taught us, the Our Father. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this must be the object of our prayers, the intention of our sufferings, and the purpose of our life. We must have no rest until our Lord's reign is established. A Catholic whose heart is not animated by this profound desire is not a Catholic. A Catholic that doesn't want the reign of the Sacred Heart of Jesus over the country with his name on our Constitution, he's not a Catholic, says Archbishop Lefebvre. He's a liberal. He's an enemy of Christ. And there are plenty of Catholic liberals today, and there were many liberal Catholics in the day of Pope Pius IX, and he said they're the biggest enemies of the Catholic Church. Not so much the atheists, not even the Satanists, but liberal Catholics are the big enemy of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Catholic Church because they want to marry the Catholic Church with the Freemasonic ideas of liberty, equality, fraternity. And that's exactly what Vatican II was, the triumph of Masonic ideas within the Church. So we have to fight and fight publicly these bad popes, these bad bishops, the, the, the Vatican II heresies and errors, the new mass, and we must proclaim it to not preach publicly against these things is a sort of betrayal against Christ the King. And that's why the silence of, of traditional Catholic bishops is not only a grave sin against justice and charity, it is a, a denial of the faith. So Archbishop Lefebvre, a Catholic whose heart is not animated by this profound desire, is not a Catholic. He is not one of the faithful of our Lord Jesus Christ. It suffices to reread these lines from St. Paul, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Now at last in these times he has spoken to us with a son to speak for him, a son whom he has appointed to inherit all things, 
just as it was through him that he created this world of, of time. Archbishop Lefebvre goes on to say, this is just all powerful and beautiful, so our Lord Jesus Christ is king now. All power has been given to him in heaven and on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, says our Lord. If then our Lord's will must be done on earth, it means that his law, the Ten Commandments, must be applied on earth as it is in heaven. We must profess this even if churchmen do not want it anymore. This is what is dividing the church at present. As for us, we want our Lord's honor. We want the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ which must be applied universally. We will fight for this, and we will do our utmost to crown Jesus Christ King. Because we speak of the social reign of our Lord, we are accused of engaging in politics. And that's a favorite, favorite insult of the liberal Catholics. Oh, you're mixing, you're mixing politics and religion. Leave the politics outside the church. This is false, and liberal Catholics believe in the separation of church and state, but true Catholics don't, because everything must be submitted to Christ the King. That Why do you think our Lord asked St. Margaret Mary, tell the King of France, put my heart on the flag? In Quebec, Quebec used to have the heart of Jesus on their flag, and there was the Catholic bishops in the 1940s that asked for it to be removed. And we Americans, we want the sacred heart of Jesus on our flag. And all Catholics throughout the world, we want the heart of Jesus on our flags. But it must express the love and adoration and obedience to Christ the King, and not just an external patch. So Archbishop Lefebvre goes on to say, the liberals will say we are accused of engaging in politics. If this is engaging in politics, then we want to do so because we want our Lord Jesus Christ to rule over us. We do not want to be governed by men who are not subject to our Lord. If only all our rulers understood that they must be subject to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He is the King. He could have been the King on earth and continue to govern us. But he will be one day when he descends upon the clouds in the, in the heavens. Everyone will have to render an account to this king and judge. Meanwhile, today we want authorities, leaders who know that they will render an account to God for the exercise of their power and their government. For we love to be subject to people and persons who do not believe themselves to be the authors of all power. So presidents truly govern when they promote the social kingship of Jesus Christ. That's why Biden has made such a fool of himself. He's the mocking, he's the laughingstock of the entire world. This poor old fool who has betrayed Christ, betrayed all the children that he has murdered by passing and over, trying to overthrow the, the Supreme Court's decision on abortion. He, he wants to fix it and codify it in the United States Constitution. This is unspeakable, horrible murder. So these fools who mock Christ, they are made fools of. And look at him. He fulfills the prophecy of the Virgin Mary when she says the proud will be knocked off their thrones. Already Biden is not even done with his phony presidency and he's already knocked off his throne. Nobody has any respect for him. And that goes with Trump. If Trump was to govern and rule correctly, he will promote the reign of Christ the King. He will promote the sacred heart of Jesus. He would ban abortion and make no exceptions. And he would ban all this rainbow parade stuff. And he would promote the the Ten Commandments, then he will be truly blessed by God. If Trump does this, he will be blessed by God and the country would be blessed enormously. And this is what we want to pray for and fight for. 
Even, says Archbishop Lefebvre, even if they have been elected by the people, the people do not have power. The people are not God. The people can designate the one who will exercise authority, but it does not give the authority. Authority comes from God. There is no power but from God, says St. Paul. This is the greatness of authority. This is the foundation, the true foundation of the power of authority, whether civil or paternal. Paternal authority comes from God. Children know that when they are subject to their parents, they are at the same time subject to God. How beautiful this is! How well God has made things, but how men destroy them! The communists say that religion is a form of alienation, the opium of the people. Yes, religion is an alienation in the sense that we convey our body, our soul, our understanding, and our will into God's hands. We alienate ourselves to give ourselves entirely to God, to the one who created us, who saved us, and who shed all his blood for us. Love for love, we desire to alienate ourselves in order to give ourselves entirely to our Lord Jesus Christ. So on this point, we are in full agreement with what the communists say about our holy religion. And I would say to these friends who are in error, you alienate yourself for a party, for men. You place your nature, your strength, and all that you have in the hands of men. That is a bad alienation. And that is not at all the order willed by God. And lastly, Archbishop Lefebvre concludes, We do not want to be subject uniquely to men who will do with us what they will. Think of the tyrant in Canada, doing with people what he wills, passing arbitrary laws that make no sense and just crush the people. We would not be allowed to think except as these men think. We would not be allowed to act except as these tyrants want to make us act. No, we want to be subject to God, and not to such men. But to men who are subject to God, yes, we are willing to be obedient and subject. That is what we think and what we want. We want to belong to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our King. So there's a beautiful summary from Archbishop Lefebvre of the social teaching on the reign of Christ the King. And this is what we must continue to fight for and build for, to form large families who love Christ the King, to fight for the reign of Christ the King, fight these rainbow parades in our streets. And if they come on your streets, get out there with the flag with the Sacred Heart on it, get out there with the crucifix, get out there with the rosary, and combat these, these works of darkness. And let's turn to the heart of Jesus in this beautiful octave of his reign, of the sacred heart of Jesus, begging him at least, come Lord, reign over my soul, reign over me, and consecrate ourselves to the heart of Jesus and Mary, consecrate your families to the sacred heart, which is not just an external picture on the wall or a statue on the shelf, but we really must strive to live those virtues of adoration, gratitude to God, reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary, and begging his mercy and begging his grace to grow in the love of God and virtue, and to practice the virtues of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Forgiveness, forgiveness of one another in the home. Teach that to your children when, when little Johnny and little Stephen get in a fight and they have a they're punching each other and it's turning to, uh, you know, hot words and, and anger. Then the father must come, call them both and say, Stephen, you say to your brother, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Johnny, you say to your brother, I am very sorry, do you forgive me? And they look away and they, that's very hard for some proud boys to do. But they shake hands, they embrace, and they say, uh, please forgive me, I am sorry. This is very, very important in, in teaching children, and they must see that also in the parents. The forgiveness between parents, the love and cherishing of the father for, his, of his, for uh, the husband for his wife. The children must see this cherishing. It's not enough to say, I love you, it's, but it must be shown within the family. It must be seen. 
this love of the spouses, this love of parents for their children, spouses for each other, and the family for God. We must show that. So let's beg the Virgin Mary to implant in us, help us to really practice these great virtues of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the grace to persevere to the end for the fight for Catholic tradition and the reign of Christ the King. Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Nostra Signora de Guadalupe! O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. And as St. Maximilian Kolbe added, and for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Amen.